Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Welcome to the first event of the IBC and Commerce Bank you know, Series for 2021. I'm George Clark, a director of the Center for the Study of Western Hemispheric Trade at Tammy Hughes AR Sanchez School of Business. Our center, together with IBC Bank and Commerce Bank, brings speakers virtually this semester for the first time. Um, we usually do this in person talk about a variety of different topics in the areas of international trade, economics, finance, and demography. And so before introducing today's speaker, I wanted to thank um, our sponsors for supporting this event, IBC and Commerce Bank. With their support, we've been able to bring many thought-provoking speakers throughout the years, Tammy, you and Laredo, and um, now we're bringing speakers virtually to, to Tammy, you. If you're new to this series, there will be a Q&A session off at the end of the presentation, so please hold your questions until the end. But if you do have questions that you, that you want to ask, you can type them in beforehand, but they won't be asked until the Q&A session um, starts. So today's speaker is Dr. William Fry. Dr. Fry is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, D.C. He's also a research professor with the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. He has authored over 200 publications and several books. Today he will be talking about diversity, Changing American Demographics and the 2020 Election. He discusses many of these topics in his most recent book, The Diversity Explosion, How New Racial Demographics Are Remaking America. With the election around the corner, we look forward to hearing about this timely issue. Thank you, Dr. Fry. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here and uh, talk with this audience uh, about demographic diversity. Um, I'm a demographer. You know, I work a lot with numbers at my computer. Uh, most of the time, uh, it's not very exciting. Um, I'm sort of a geek, I guess you could say. But a couple of times, uh, every once in a while, people are interested in American dem demography. And this is one of those years. Uh, it's the year of the 2020 census, and it's the year of the 2020 election. Now, I don't have any results yet from the 2020 census. We don't know the results from the 2020 census. It's an interesting topic in itself, and maybe somebody wants to ask me a question about that, too, at the end. Uh, given the, the issues that are going on and the collecting of data and so forth. Uh, but uh, this is the 2020 election year, and I'm going to say a little bit about that. Uh, a lot of what I'm talking about is from my book, Diversity Explosion, and that was just mentioned. Um, so the first part of my talk is going to be about uh, that book, uh, which talks about the changing racial demographics of the United States uh, from the 2010 census all the way up for the last several years, where we have lots of other information about it. Uh, and then I'm going to move into a little bit more of a focus on millennials as a bridge generation. And by the bridge generation, I mean uh, because we're coming so racially diverse in this country, it's the, it's the millennial generation that is, you know, sort of getting in, I wouldn't say middle age yet, but uh, they're in their 20s and 30s. And they're the kind of bridge between, you know, somewhat the less diverse older generations and then Generation Z. So I want to say a little bit about that millennial generation important for our society, it's important for our politics, uh, which we'll get around to. And then finally, I'm going to talk about diversity and presidential elections, the last few presidential elections, what we might expect for the 2020 election and the role of demographics and demographic diversity over time. Uh, in my book, uh, I talk about how the country is really becoming more racially diverse, that this period in our country is really a pivotal period with respect to racial demographics. Uh, transforming the country from what used to be a largely baby boomer uh, in most of the country, a, a white baby boomer culture uh, in the last half of the 20th century to the 21st century, which is a more youthful, racially diverse demographic, uh, which is really going to define where we're going. Uh, now, I'm, as you might see, an old baby boomer myself. Uh, so I remember the, the late 19, the late 20th century. Uh, you know, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, and I know that us baby boomers, we were sometimes called the Woodstock generation, and uh, we changed a lot of things or a lot of movements, social movements around the baby boomers, the women's movement uh, and civil rights movements and so forth. Uh, so, you know, we've done an awful lot, but we're sort of moving out of the picture, I think. And in this, this particular period, we're started focusing on uh, a much more racially diverse population. Now, what you're seeing here on my presentation is uh, uh, something from the Census Bureau going from 1970 up to 2050. The first bar shows the relative size of the um, Anglo population, the, the non-Hispanic white population in the United States. The second bar, the size of the total number of people of color, as we're defining them today. 
Uh, and uh, you can see as we move all the way up, uh, up until fairly recently, that white population took up a big part of the U.S. population, uh, even in Texas for a while. And uh, so, uh, but when we get to 2040 and 2050 for the nation as a whole, uh, we're going to become a, a place where the white population is less than half of the population. And I think people look at this and they're interested in it. And uh, of course, you know, in Texas and California and a lot of the Southwest, we're, we're much further along in that. Uh, but still for the nation as a whole, people get kind of interested in what's happening. Some of them are a little afraid of it. Some of them are embracing it. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what all of that means. If we look at the demographics of the US population right now, uh, we're about 60%, uh, 60.4% white. The 2020 census will undoubtedly show that we're 60% white as a nation, about 18% Hispanics, 5% Asian. Of course, in Texas, 41% uh, white, 40% Hispanic, so uh, very different there. But uh, I think that uh, this is the direction the country's going in. Uh, I wanna say a few things right off the bat. Uh, about this change. One, I want to talk about the rapid growth of new minorities. So what do I mean by new minority? I think uh, I don't want to offend anybody because I know that the Latino population has been here for a very long time, but in terms of recent growth, recent very fast growth, the new minorities are uh, Latinos or Hispanics, uh, Asian Americans, and people of two or more race. Uh, if you look at this chart here, which shows the growth between the period 2015 and 2060 of different racial and ethnic groups in the United States, on the left-hand side, those three bars, and then over that period, 45-year uh, period, Hispanics are gonna almost double, Asians will double, people of two or more races, people who check on the census that they're not just one race, but several races, uh, will probably triple. Uh, so that's a really rapid growth uh, of that group. And you know they have accounted for about four-fifths of the growth in the whole United States over the last 20 years and they're gonna be really important. And a lot of people think that all of the growth of these new minorities is from immigration. Well, well, some of it is from past immigration, that's certainly for sure. But in the last 10 years, only about 25% of the growth of the Hispanic population is from immigration. The other 75% has to do with what we demographers call natural increase, that is the excess of births over deaths. Uh, so that's really the main growth of the Hispanic population. The Asian population still is pretty much through immigration over the last 10 years, about three quarters of the growth is from immigration. Uh, but to, to, to paint it all as, a, as an impact of, of current or future immigration is not exactly right because uh, we're going to become more racially diverse irrespective of the immigration patterns that we have in the U.S. Uh, go back to this again. The second point is the diminished growth and the rapid aging of the white population. So uh, going back to this chart again, you can look at between this 2015 and 2060, the Census Bureau projects a 10% decline in the white population. Well, why is that? Well, the white population is a lot older than all the other populations, and therefore uh, there are gonna be more deaths than births within the white population over this period uh, because they're a lot older. And among the many younger whites who are the children of interracial marriages, uh, they're going to count themselves as the two or more race category of the population. So we're talking about a nation uh, that for most kids born in the United States today are gonna live most of their lives in a country where the white population is declining in number and also uh, aging very rapidly. And why? that's why it's so important that we have all these young, racially diverse new minorities in the United States. And of course, the black population is growing by 37%, the American Indian, Alaska Native population, only 14% over this year. And uh, the third point I'm just gonna say a little bit about is black migration reversals. You know, for a long history in the United States, blacks have moved out of the South to the North and to the West Coast uh, and uh, have pretty much stuck in central cities. And we're gonna show here that that's very much changing. Uh, blacks are moving back to the South, but part, parts of the new South, parts of the prosperous South, as well as to the suburbs for the first time uh, in large numbers. Uh, and the last is the point is that we are shifting to a no racial majority nation. Uh, in fact, very soon, uh, I don't know how you feel about it. I think there's some discussion about it is, you know, should we even have these sharp racial groups in the United States? Uh, does it matter that much anymore to be an American, how, how you identify with one racial group or another? Uh, but people have different views about this. As I say, some people are scared of it. Uh, some people uh, are embracing it. Uh, but it's it's a reality, and uh, irrespective of whatever immigration patterns we have in the future, irrespective of uh, other kinds of shifts, 
uh, you know, this is where we're going as a country. And demographically, it's quite a good thing is what I'm going to show you today. Um, I want to talk about two ways we're becoming more diverse. One of them is by generation, and that is the younger generations are the ones that are becoming more racially diverse first, and then uh, geographically by dispersal from the melting pot parts of the country. Those are big melting pot immigrant magnet areas uh, out to the rest of the country is the way we're becoming more diverse. Talking a little bit about the, uh, from, the from the younger ages to the older ages, here's a graph uh, which shows in 2015 uh, the racial composition of different age groups. At the bottom is for the under age five age group, all the way going up to the top to the 85 and over age group. So about in 2015, about 50% of the under age five population in the United States was uh, white or Anglo, 26% Latino, 13% uh, black, 5% Asian, and so forth. But as you move up the age structure, of course, you get to the 85 and over population nationally, and that's uh, that's very white. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have something up there called a cultural generation gap. And this is something I write about in my book. It's something that's taken over a little bit of the social discourse, sometimes the political discourse, where there are a lot of older Americans, people my age, this doesn't include me, but a lot of older Americans my age, a little bit scared of how the population is becoming more racially diverse. They're, it's not the, that's not the America they grew up in. Uh, and uh, it's changing. Their attitudes are changing, but it's something that's been there for a while, and uh, uh, it's different than the younger generation who are interested in diversity. The, even among the white population, uh, there are much more positive attitudes about interracial marriage, interracial dating, immigration, um, you know, improving the criminal justice system, these kinds of issues. Uh, and you see this in the politics. Uh, a political scientist or a political commentator Ronald Brownstein writes about what he calls uh, the division between the gray and the brown, uh, the gray being the older generations and the brown being increasingly racially diverse younger generations and how they vote and the kinds of issues that are important to them, especially sort of government spending. Lots of times older, older, uh, older folks, older whites, but older folks in general maybe don't want to spend that much in terms of uh, uh, government, big federal programs and so forth, where Younger generation, yeah, they want to have those programs for their schools, for their health care, and for stuff like that. Uh, there are other issues, too, that aren't related to the racial and ethnic demographic change, like in the, envi uh, immigrant, in the environmental issues and, and issues like that that younger people are much more in favor of. But there is kind of a cultural generation gap. Uh, the sort of the, the cultural and the racial makeup of these different generations may have something to do with it, and we see it in politics all the time. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. I want to do just a little bit of a slideshow here. This is a kind of primitive slideshow. This is this shows the, the race ethnic distribution of different age groups going from zero to nine on the left up to 70 and over on the right in 2020. This is the projections, as I say, we don't know the 2020 census numbers yet. But clearly, it shows what we did before. That over zero to nine age group is uh, less than half white and goes up to the uh, to the baby boomers who are now age 56 to 74, uh, getting to be very white. But let's flip ahead from 2020 to 2035, and all of those age groups become a little bit more racially diverse. By 2035, the population under age 40 will be minority white in the United States. Uh, and uh, but still, those older folks uh, that are around will be uh, be more, mostly white. And then let's take it up to 2050, and we see people under age uh, 50 in the United States uh, will be minority white. Uh, for some of those age groups, a very large share of the population are Latinos. That's nationwide. And so uh, this is a population that this is the way it's going to be. Uh, these projections may be off a little bit. As I say, immigration uh, may account for some of that change, but certainly not for all of the change that we're seeing. So even if we change our immigration policies, this is likely the way we're going to change in the future. And it's kind of important, uh, irrespective or including the politics, I guess you could say, because, you know, even for older folks who are concerned about their Social Security, concerned about their Medicare, how's gonna, how that's going to be paid for, it means that these younger, more racially diverse generations are going to have to be productive, be able to contribute to those. Not only not only is it important for them to get ahead for themselves, but for the country as a whole. So uh, if we just look at this chart here, projected change in the labor force population between, well, labor force age population between 2010 and 2030. Of course, we're right in the middle of that now. 
Uh, but over that period, you see a lot of the white population is, is retiring. They're, get, they're getting to be past age 65. So we see the decline of maybe 15 million uh, white people over the, that period of time and an increase of about 16 million Hispanics and also more than 5 million Asians, more blacks. So all of the gains in the labor force age population over this period of time uh, is going to be made from the uh, from uh, people of color uh, and again young people as they're moving into those ages. Okay, so we're becoming more racially diverse from the bottom of the age structure upward. We're also becoming more racially diverse from melting pot regions outward. And here is a map that I, you know, actually first put together back in around 2000 or so, uh, where I wanted to classify different regions in the country between melting pot regions, which are places that are, you know, have had big immigrant magnet areas, especially for Latino and Asian uh, folks, but many other groups as well. Uh, states like Texas and California and Florida and Illinois with Chicago there and New York. Uh, and then there's a bunch of states that I have the new Sun Belt. These are states that have been growing in their economic patterns and attracting a lot of people from other states in the southeast and in the mountain west. And then there's kind of a light uh, yellow part, what I call the heartland. It's not it's a, it's a charitable way of talking about states that haven't been growing very rapidly at all. Uh, but, but back in the 1980s and early 90s, as it turned out, a lot of the uh, new racial diversity was pretty much confined, especially with Latinos, uh, in, the new, in the melting pot states. Wasn't much, not much spilling out to the other parts of the country. So uh, I started wrote a couple pieces back then about the balkanization of the United States that I didn't think was a very good thing. That uh, a lot of the rest of the country was not participating in this diversity. But as I kept following the numbers in the late 90s and 2000s, and really for the last 20 or 25 years, there has been a pretty wide dispersion of Hispanics and Asians and other groups into those middle parts of the country, especially the the new Sun Belt, they were able, also being able to take jobs there, both high and low-skilled jobs in those areas, and even to some degree in the heartland, uh, making the country, making it more spread out. We weren't sort of divided as we were in race and ethnicity as we were back in the early 1980s. Here is uh, data from 2010 to 2018, which shows what I call uh, uh, new uh, Hispanic uh, growth areas. Uh, and uh, these are areas that grew by at least 150% in their Hispanic populations between 2010 and 2018. And you see them scattered all over the country. Uh, now, they don't always have big uh, Hispanic populations, but they have rapidly growing Hispanic populations. You know, in Iowa and Pennsylvania, uh, lots of the parts of the southeast and even in the mountain west, a lot of places in Florida. Uh, so this has been happening, and, and this is part of the diversity that's going on. This map. Uh, shows for all the counties in the United States, there's about 3,100 counties, uh, racial and ethnic groups that are highly represented, that is represented in those counties to a higher percentage than they are nationally. And they're different colors. So if you look at Texas, many of the counties in Texas are dark green, which means there's a high Hispanic representation in those counties. Some others are light green, means there are two or Two, two different kinds of groups are overrepresented uh, in those areas, probably African Americans and Hispanics, and many of them. But if you go over into California and Arizona, Nevada, there's also Asian and Hispanics that are overrepresented. But uh, look at the South. A good part of the South has those red counties, and that shows counties where African Americans are overrepresented. Now, most people know there are a lot of blacks in the South, uh, but what people, a lot of people don't understand is that's been increasing. Uh, for many decades in the earlier part of the 20th century, there was a black out-migration from the South. But especially in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been a significant black movement back to the South. Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida are states that are attracting lots of African Americans back there. They tend to be younger blacks. They tend to be blacks who have at least uh, have some college or a college education uh, are more likely to move to these areas. Uh, and to some degree, some retiree blacks say, from the north or from the west decided to go to retire to, the, to, the, to these southern states. Some of them were never born there. Maybe they didn't even, their parents were not from the south. But something about the southern culture, something about the environment there, uh, these data have shown, when you look at migration data, that there, there are significant black migration back to the south. And uh, then when you look at about diverse America, it's diverse in different ways across different parts of the country. Now, you see there's a lot of counties there that are white. Uh, uh, there, a lot of them are like really small counties in that there's not many people living there. 
Uh, so only about 30% of the population live in those counties where no other racial or ethnic group is, is, is highly represented. Uh, and many of them are declining in population. So we're, we're becoming more diverse all over the country. And, and I think this is something to keep in mind as we talk about some of the other issues here. Um, talking about how we're becoming more integrated in the United States, I'm just going to say a few things about each of these topics. Uh, we always talk about melting pot cities, but we're now getting to have melting pot suburbs. Uh, we have racial segregation, which is still very high in the United States, but it's gradually coming down. Not as fast as it ought to be, but it's coming down. Uh, there are multiracial marriages, uh, more multiracial uh, persons who identify with two or more races. And then, of course, extending the political ba battleground. Uh, here's about moving into the suburbs from 1990 to 2010 from those censuses. Of course, the white population, between 74 and 78 percent of them have lived in the suburbs nationally. For Asians, more than half, even since 1990, have lived in the suburbs. Hispanics, for the first time in 2000, had more than half living in the suburbs. But in 2010, for the very first time, there are more blacks living in the suburbs than in the cities of the nation's 100 largest metropolitan areas. Uh, so this is something that shows, uh, you know, the long history of, of the segre of segregation and discrimination, especially among blacks, in moving to suburban areas. And uh, to some degree, that's opened up a bit. And it also has a lot to do with younger uh, black families who decide that they want to live in the suburbs, that there's something about the American dream that's in the suburbs that's attracted people over the decades. And that's happening at the same time. Here's a black-white segregation levels. This is an index that goes from zero to 100. Zero means there's no segregation, meaning that blacks and whites living in a metropolitan area are distributed about the same across neighborhoods. 100 means blacks are in one set of neighborhoods, whites are in a strictly other set of neighborhoods. And up until about 1970, we've had very high levels of uh, segregation uh, in metropolitan areas of the United States. Since then, since 1968, the passage of the Fair Housing Act and other measures that were taken, there has been some decline in segregation. But a segregation index of 50 or 55 is still pretty high. Uh, so uh, we can't pat ourselves in the back of the country too much to saying that segregation has come down because it really needs to come down more. It's still really high in a lot of northern areas which have lost black populations over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the segregation index in Milwaukee is 79 right now, but a lot of the segregation indices in the south have come down to below 60 when prior to that, and back in 1970, they were 80 or higher. Uh, so this is a Good news, but not great news uh, sort of measure of integration. And the other one is uh, multiracial marriages, a percent of all marriages. Uh, in 1960, less than one half a percent of all marriages were multiracial. Uh, and that increased over time. So in 2015, almost 10 percent of all marriages are multiracial. A high number of them are Latino white marriages or Latino, or Latino white marriages or Asian and white marriages, uh, about three in 10 uh, Latinos who are married are inter interracial marriage, the same for Asians. And if you look at the more recent marriages, just ones who got married in 2011 to 2015, rather than all the marriages in 2015, that's up to 16%. Uh, black interracial marriages are not as high as Hispanic and Asian interracial marriages, but they're also increasing, and they're increasing especially among younger generations of blacks. So these are a couple measures that show some index of racial integration nationally over time. Uh, and it's actually more pervasive among younger people uh, in the United States. Now I want to talk something about uh, millennials, because I, as I started to say earlier, millennials are this kind of bridge generation. Um, let's go back to 1980, uh, to my generation, the baby boomers. And uh, back in 1980, the baby boomers were aged 16 to 34. And, and this is a population pyramid, if you're not used to looking at it. It goes in the bottom from zero, age zero to four up to 80 to five and over, label's not quite there. Uh, and the size of each bar is the size of the population in each of these age groups. Look at how many baby boomers there are. They made up about a third of the population in 1980. So it's no wonder that baby boomers had, even today you can listen to songs by baby boomer, you know, artists uh, in their 70s uh, that are still pretty popular and, and uh, made up a huge impact on our culture. Well, now let's move to 2015. Uh, the baby boomers are still there. Uh, but now millennials are kind of a big hump of the population, uh, depending on how you count them. In 2015, they were ages 18 to 34. 
They're now up to age 18. They're, they're now up to age 39. And uh, uh, they're uh, not a third of the population. They're only about 22% of the population. And baby boomers are almost 22% of the population. So they're kind of similar in size. But, but millennials are starting to make their, you know, their, their uh, influence felt in all kinds of ways, in the economy and politics and, and ways like that. Uh, but what you see, like the baby boomers, they're a bigger generation. In other words, the, the population in the age groups right older than them and right younger than them are smaller than the millennials, which is also the case with the baby boomers. But that's why they're having some kind of impact. The other thing about millennials, of course, they're more racially diverse uh, as, as than older generations, and the generations younger than them are more racially, gener more racially diverse um, than they are. This is a quick slide that sort of summarizes something we discussed before. Uh, millennials are about 56% white. Uh, baby boomers are more, ba mostly baby boomers are 75% white. Interestingly, Generation X, uh, the forgotten generation, uh, is, uh, has the same kind of racial demographic as the U.S. population, uh, about 62% white, or nationally we're about 60% white, similar uh, percentages of Hispanics and blacks and so forth. So uh, uh, the, baby, the millennials are sort of leading the way toward this more racially diverse population. They're also kind of a more global generation. 25% of millennials uh, speak a language other than English at home. 16% speak Spanish at home. 29% are first or second generation Americans among millennials. Among uh, Latino millennials, 70% are first or second generation. Among Asian American millennials, 92% are first or second generation. And about 14% of marriages are interracial among millennials, much higher than they were among baby boomers and so forth. Another thing about millennials is they're more educated than earlier generations. This is a slide that shows for the years, or for the category, for the generations, baby boomers, Gen X, and millennials, how many of them had graduated from college at age 25 to 34. Uh, nationally, uh, in 2015, it was about 30, 36%. Uh, nationally, here it's differ for different age groups. Among white millennials, it's up to 43%, way up from what it used to be, 27%. Uh, for Asians, it goes very high, uh, and for Blacks and Hispanics, also increasing. So uh, the good news is there's a lot more education among millennials. The not-so-good news is that uh, we as a nation need to do more, more to uh, invest more resources in our schools, especially for the growing Latino population, the Black population, but for all child populations, really, uh, because, uh, you know, this is they're our future, as we saw in the earlier demographics. And these numbers were before the pandemic. They do take into account what happened to millennials during the Great Recession of 2008 uh, and the housing bust and so forth that occurred there. But I suspect some of these divisions may even be wider after the pandemic. And that's something we really do need to pay attention to as a country, uh, not only for these particular uh, children in these groups, our young people coming along, but for the nation as a whole. Millennials, uh, uh, as they are a minority share of 10 states' populations. Those 10 uh, states in the Southwest, and Georgia and Florida as well, and as well as Texas, of course, uh, you know, more than half of their millennial population are people of color. Another 10 states, at least 40% of them are people of color. Uh, so it's a very diverse generation. Only a bunch of states, only a few states, uh, eight or nine states, I think it's eight states, have uh, more than 80% white among their millennial population, like Montana or North Dakota or West Virginia, a couple of New England states. Uh, so and if you look at individual metropolitan areas, uh, you see Los Angeles, 27% of their millennial population is white. Over half are Latino, Houston, 32% white. Uh, a very high share are Latino. New York and Chicago uh, have combined uh, Black and Hispanic populations that are about equal to their Hispanic, uh, sorry, Black and Asian populations that are about e equal to their Hispanic population. And then there are places like Minneapolis, St. Paul that still have a largely white uh, Latino population, or a largely white uh, millennial population. So, you know, it's hard to characterize all millennials exactly the same way, but, uh, you know, they are, are much more racially diverse. And it is important, I think, as we move forward as a country, given that the fact that our demography is very much depending on them and our economy is very much depending on them, that uh, we sort of pay attention to their issues. And as they move into middle age, 
uh, they are going to be role models. They're going to find examples as to, uh, you know, how a diverse nation will succeed. And I think that's important. Um, this is the aging of the millennial population. Uh, 2020 millennials are more or less 25 to 39, depending on how you count them. People, people have the different exact N years, but more or less 25 to 39. By 2035, millennials will be 40 to 54. Uh, you know, and then, you know, 55 and over in uh, in the year uh, in the year 2050. So millennials get older just like everyone else, but as they grow older, the rest of the country becomes more racially diverse. Now I want to talk a little bit about the diver the, the political uh, impacts of racial diversity in presidential elections. And I first want to talk about the, the essentially the the election of Barack Obama 2008 to 2012, and then Donald Trump in 2016, and how the the voting patterns and so forth went. First. We can look at the race ethnic profiles of eligible voters. Now, eligible voters are people age 18 and over who are citizens. So they're not quite as racially diverse as the whole population, because as we know it's, it's the younger part of the population that's the most diverse, but still uh, it's getting that way. And so in 2004, 75% of eligible voters were white down in 2020, 66.9% are white. Uh, so in Texas, by the way, it's about 50% of eligible voters are white compared to about 40% of the total population that's white. But this is what's important to look at is the voting patterns of these different racial and ethnic groups. Uh, here show what's called the Democratic minus Republican voting margins. That's a complicated way of saying the percent voting Democrat minus the percent voting Rep Republican. So if it's a, it's a positive number, it means they're more voting for Democrats, it's of a negative number, it's more voting for Republicans. I'm not, I didn't do this to make a value judgment about what's the right way to vote, but easier to put the chart together this way. Uh, but it's interesting to look at blacks. Uh, in 2004, 2008, 2012, and 2016, it's those two middle elections where Barack Obama was running for president. You have the highest Democratic voting percentage for blacks. Uh, still high in all those years, as it has been. Blacks have voted Democratic in every presidential election since 1936, so it's not surprising that that's the case. The two other uh, non-white groups, Hispanics and Asians, also showed higher Democratic voting in the two Obama years than they did in the 2016 uh, Trump year. For whites, who have voted for Republican presidential candidates in every presidential election since 1968, these elections were no exception. They don't have as big of a Republican margin, meaning a negative margin there, as the are for the other groups, but they're applied to a much bigger population. The white population is much bigger, so they have a big impact on the votes. And you can see that uh, uh, over time, these voting patterns, uh, especially the, the minority voting patterns for Barack Obama had a lot to do with him winning. Uh, you know, turns out Trump wins in uh, 2016, but uh, still the Democrat took the popular vote. And so these are also helped contributed to that as well. This is another chart which I think is important given what we talked about in ter terms of the cultural generation gap. This shows the same kind of voting margins for four different age groups within each of these clumps. One clump is for whites, one clump is, clump is for people of color, final clump is everybody else. So look at the right-hand clump. The first two categories are for the 18 to 29 and 30 to 44 year old age groups. The last two categories are the 45 to 64 and 65 and over age groups. Those last two age groups voted for Republican because they have negative margins. The, old, the younger age groups voted Democratic. Uh, and, you know, that goes along with uh, what we thought about is that cultural generation gap. Some of the messages of the Republican candidates were more appealing to older, the older population than the younger population. You could say that part of that uh, age divide has something to do with the racial composition of each of those different age groups. After all, there are many more people of color in the younger age groups than in the older age groups. And as you can see in the middle chart, people of color in general vote strongly Democratic, especially people under age 45. But even among whites, all of whom voted Republican, all of those age groups voted Republican in 2016, the younger white age group, the 18 to 29 year olds, then millennials, uh, were much less likely to vote Republican. Uh, this this kind of picture, this age race uh, voting pattern picture, is for 2016, but it also looks pretty much the same for 2012 and for 2008 when Barack Obama won. It's just and, and in all three elections, as I said, the Democrats got got more popular votes than the Republican candidate. But in 2016, the uh, Electoral College had something to say about Donald Trump winning. 
a little bit about how that's changed over time. This shows the red and blue voting patterns of different states in the United States uh, in 2004 when George Bush won, and in 2008 and in 2012 when Barack Obama won. Back in 2004, George Bush won those red states that he won were pretty much like a lot of Republicans have one in the past, with some exceptions, like when there was a Southern Democrat running or something like that, uh, because uh, most of the South, in fact, all of the South in this case, a uh, good part of the Great Plains states and uh, the Mountain West states were Republican states. The Democrats took the coastal states and then some of New England and a lot of these Midwestern industrial states. But the fast-growing states in the country were, vote were voting Republican uh, in 2004. Both 2008 and in 2012, Barack Obama picked off a lot of Southern and Mountain West states like Virginia and North Carolina and Florida and uh, in the Mountain West, Nevada and Colorado and New Mexico. Uh, and part of that has to do with the changing demography, which I talked about earlier, how the country is becoming more, more racially diverse inwardly. And also because of the somewhat higher voting margins among minorities in those states. Uh, the light blue states, as opposed to the black blue, dark blue states are ones where minorities voted Democratic and whites voted Republican, but the Democrats still won. So you could say in those states, minorities had everything to do uh, with winning those states for Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012. Well, let's look at 2016, won by Donald Trump uh, when he, against Hillary Clinton. A somewhat similar picture, except that Donald Trump was able to take Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin and Ohio. Uh, how did that happen with the same demography? Well, it turned out there were more older whites, and especially people that they call non-college whites, uh, voted uh, for Trump in that election. Uh, not as many minorities turned out to vote in that election in those states. Trump also took Florida uh, and took North Carolina, but the Democrats still took those Mountain West states of Nevada, Colorado, and uh, New Mexico. So they still held on to some of those gains that Barack Obama made, but uh, uh, those northern states, by the way, most of those northern states, or at least Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, voted Democratic in every presidential election since 1988, up until 2016 when they voted Republican. Uh, so uh, the racial aspects of the voting patterns were also important here. Uh, not as a lot of people predicted that, uh, you know, uh, minorities, uh, non-whites would, would win for the Democrats uh, another presidential election, but uh, we're going to see what we're going to see this time. I want to look at the 2018 midterms. Uh, here is something I did as kind of a thought experiment. I know there's all these polls around. You can look and see every day in the paper who has the most votes between Biden, who has the most votes for Trump, and all of this. Here I was looking at the presidential election voting margins in 2016 and comparing them nationally with House elections. Now, I know voting for a president is different than voting for your House of Representatives, and so it's kind of comparing apples and oranges, but I wanted to get a sense of whether the same racial voting patterns were occurring in the midterms, and they pretty much were, with the exception of the white voters, were even voting Republicans, but less likely, only half as likely to vote Republican as they were in 2016. In 2018, it was 10% Republican compared to 20% in 2016. So I wanted to look a little further into those white patterns, make the same comparison for whites in different age groups. And remember, in 2016, all of the white age groups voted Republican, uh, with not as much for the under 18 to 29-year-old group. But when you look at the House election, those young whites voted Democrat for their House of Representatives uh, candidates, and the 30 to 44 group was more or less even now, the older age group still voted Republican, but in fact, not quite as much Republican as they did in 2016. So um, this gives us a clue that maybe, uh, you know, uh, the uh, those older white voters in some of those states like Pennsylvania and, and uh, Michigan and Wisconsin may not be voting as strongly as uh, as they did last time, but we'll only know when we go to the election. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about uh, getting back to millennials and Gen Zers. Uh, now, millennials and Gen Zers are old enough so that 37% of them combined, uh, they make 37% of eligible voters in the United States, about the same as baby boomers and pre-boomers or people that are older than boomers. So they now have a much bigger shot at uh, having an impact on this next election, again, Generation X kind of in the middle there, if they turn out a lot 
Uh, usually young people don't turn out as much as older people, but I have an idea with all of these uh, protests and activism that we've been seeing in the last couple of months, there will be bigger to turnout among uh, younger generations, and they're more racially diverse. This is the eligible, or eligible voter racial profiles of different age groups, uh, Gen Z and millennials, more racially diverse, 21% Latino of Gen Z among eligible voters, and then the older population are whiter. And here among states, these are the non-white share of eligible voters for people under age 40. So that's everybody that's a millennial or younger who are eligible voters. And again, you see a lot of these southern and western states. In particular, look at Arizona and Texas and Georgia and Florida. These are swing. I don't know if you folks think Texas is a swing state, but some people think it might be. And so Arizona, Texas, Georgia, and Florida uh, are have almost for half of their young eligible voters are minorities. So here's just a peek, peek of how the under age 40 eligible voters uh, compare with all age voters in a few states like Arizona, 44% of the under age 40 folks are Latinos uh, of eligible voters. In Georgia, uh, a big share are black and Hispanic. And of course in Texas, that's the case, only 43% of uh, the under age 40 eligible voters are Anglo. So we'll see what happens. Uh, in uh, November about uh, what kind of impact these younger voters are going to have. So I just want to kind of wrap this up with a couple looks at projections for the future with a project that I work on with some other colleagues here in Washington at other think tanks. Uh, you can look ahead at the percent of eligible voters in the United States who are Latino goes goes up from, uh, from uh, up to about 18 percent or so in uh, 2036. Asians move up. Uh, in 2016, the eligible voters who were white uh, were about 59 percent, uh, sorry, were about 69 percent, uh, whereas in 2016, they go down to about 59 percent. They lose about 10 percent of the eligible voters in the U.S. Uh, still, if you look at the 2016 size of eligible voter populations by age, and here I'm looking at 18 to 29, 30 to 44, 45 to 64, and 65 and over, there are two bars there showing for each of the years, 2016 and 2028, the size of that older age group gets bigger and it's still pretty white. Uh, even though the younger age groups uh, get bigger too and they become more racially diverse. So the, the kind of issues that we've seen in the way people have voted, older people voted one way, especially older white people versus younger people, uh, may still be with us when we get to 2028, even though we see this increasing diversity and we see going ahead uh, even more racially diverse states in the middle of the country. I won't spend too much time on that one. But here is a, uh, I did with my colleagues in this project called the States of Change Project, and just a bit of a plug, we're gonna come out with a new report next week, which updates some of this. Uh, but this essentially looks at the voting patterns in 2016 by age and race in each state and applies them to those same voting patterns to the changing demography over time. In other words, over time in 2020 even, uh, many of those Midwest states are a little bit less or a little bit more diverse, have a few more, a few more whites who have college educations, and by 2024, the country becomes more racially diverse and so forth. And if you do that, the Democrats actually eke out a win with 2016 voting patterns, but new demography. Uh, if you look at one simulation that we did and continue to gain over time in 2006, in, in 2024 and 2036, now, we did other simulations which showed that Republicans win all of those three elections, but you have to make assumptions then about increasing the vote of the white non-college uh, educated population above and beyond what it was in 2016. So that's a kind of a thought experiment you can do. So I'm just going to wrap all of this up uh, because we've talked about a lot of things. I think this country is moving in a good direction uh, because we're coming more racially diverse among our younger generations, which are going to make us a much more open country in terms of our global economy, in terms of being able to be more tolerant about things. Uh, but I do think in order to do that as a nation, we have to invest in our younger, more diverse generations in all kinds of ways, especially education. I also think that we need to uh, look at where these new generations or these new diverse generations are moving in the inner, in, inner parts of the country that haven't had much diversity in the past and make sure that they're welcome there as well. I also think that this cultural generation gap that we've seen in some recent elections um, will probably go away as more uh, young people get in positions of prominence and people understand the uh, importance of diversity in this country. So I'm going to end on a positive note, and I think we can uh, end and have questions. 
Thank you very much, Doctor. So I, um, I, now everyone will be clapping, but you can't hear us because uh, only I have my um, only I have my microphone on. So what we'd like to do now is we'd like to enter a question and answer session. So if, you, um, if you're in the audience, you can't speak. What we want you to do is we want you to type your questions in for Doctor Fry into the question and answer panel, and both he and I can see them, and I will read some of them to him. If he's missing, because he'll be talking as, as uh, he answers your question. So please go ahead and, and submit your questions. Um, for the um, for the for the moment, I'll, I'll kick it off. I, I had um, two two questions, and um, what, one is on the demographic question. And I was thinking about the states that already have become quite diverse. Um, the six melting pot states that you listed, and there's a huge political difference between Texas and California. And yet, these, these, these seem to have been the same demographic pool, and I'm wondering what causes that. And the second question I, I have is, do you think that voting patterns will hold out over time? Is it, will millennials become more conservative or more Republican as they get older, or is it that they'll keep um, with, their, with, with their voting patterns now? Well, those are two very good questions. Uh, the California-Texas one is especially interesting because I think it, has a lot to do with the political histories of each of those states. Um, you know, in California, I think that um, there were some uh, Republican candidates, I mean, this is not the whole reason, but one of the reasons, uh, their governor, Pete Wilson, quite a while ago, uh, came up with some, lots of legislation which alienated, alienated a lot of immigrants and people of color in that state. Uh, because uh, it said various rules about uh, immigrants or uh, could not uh, be uh, able to get certain kinds of rights and privileges or access to certain kinds of government funds and so forth. Uh, and there's been a big backlash against that Republican Party in uh, California as it become more came more racially diverse over time. And uh, even though they've had a few Republican, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan was or um, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was a was a Republican, uh, uh, but for the most part, they've had Democratic state uh, uh, officials. And I think a lot of that had to do with the changing demography, but also a particular backlash among that those demographic groups, and also maybe because older whites uh, maybe were kind of ashamed about the way that happened. That's just one explanation. There are probably many others, but that's one I look at. Um, for Texas, um, you know, I think uh, the demography is almost the same as in, in California in terms of the racial diversity that's there. Uh, maybe not as much turnout for some of the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, some of the groups that might have made, made it the same. But it turns out that white Republican um, voting is very strong in Texas. And over the margins, the Democratic versus Republican, mar the Republican versus Democratic margins of whites in Texas is much larger than it is for for whites in California. Whites still vote Republican in California, but not nearly as much. That may have something to do with the different parts of Texas. Texas has, has a very large kind of rural area, which maybe they feel that the Republican Party is doing a, a lot for them. And, uh, uh, you know, they want to keep riding that ship. Uh, and and so uh, that's when I look at it as a demographer. The demography is, is kind of the same, but when you look at the voting patterns of the different racial groups, in uh, in Texas, that white Republican vote is much stronger than the white Republican vote in California. Now, the issue of uh, you know the are younger liberal millennials and Gen Zers going to stay liberal as they get older? Because you know, I don't know. I'm a baby boomer, and a lot of people I knew that were very liberal when I was young are not so liberal anymore. Uh, and I think there's a lot of studies that show that to be the case. Uh, but I think you may make the case that especially among people who are first and second generation Americans um, have a different view of what this country is and what it can do for them and how they feel about uh, the government support they've gotten and what maybe their children and grandchildren should have. They're younger. If you look at the, if you look at the Latino population, median age of Latinos in the United States is about 30. Uh, median age of, of Asians are a little bit higher. Uh, but not the age of 44 of whites are. And so, uh, you know, I think that this kind of youthful and, and the fact that, that there are these kinds of issues that are binding them together, uh, not just within the Latino community, but we saw in these, these kind of uh, uh, protests and, and uh, activities that we saw in the last few months, 
people of many younger gener many uh, racial backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds were getting together to deal with this. And that may stay with them for a while. It's hard to know. I mean, they may still band against these older baby boomers as they get older, right? And they, and they forget, uh, especially as, as uh, this huge generation starts, to, you know, the cashing the Social Security checks and so forth that they're going to be paying into. Uh, so that may, may be part of it, too. But interestingly enough, this group that, are, that do simulations with me, we're going to put out a report next Monday. We're actually going to make that assumption that these younger generations keep the same voting patterns that they had as they get older. I won't give you the answer, but you can probably guess what it will be uh, as, as we move ahead. Thank you. We've now got a lot of questions from the audience, so I'll try to go through as many as I can. I apologize if I don't reach your question in advance. Um, so the first question we have is from Arthur Soto Vasquez, and he says, Dr. Fry, how stable do you think these racial categories are? In other words, given the rates of intermarriage and racial diversity within the category of Latinos, will some Latinos start to see themselves as white? How flexible is whiteness? Well, that's a very good question. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, I always say that the Census Bureau and the government statistics are, you know, they try their best to keep up with these classifications, but they're at best 10 years behind where the country is. And so, no, it's, you know, it's very important to have these categories. They're not just put together by the Census Bureau. They're put together by the Office of Management and Budget, which is a, an office of the president, uh, which means that these categories are used across all government agencies, uh, to be able to award various kinds of grants and to give out government funds that are you know, applied to different racial groups and so forth that are in law. So it's a very serious thing, and there are lots of different advocacy groups uh, that come together in, in, in advising the government how to make these categories. So I was a little flip when I said they're a little bit behind, but I do think that over time, as we become more of a melting pot nation, um, that uh, we're going to see some of these categories blend in a little more. There, there are studies that have done by the, by the Pew Research Center that show that I think by the third generation, uh, fewer uh, Latinos say that they're Latinos, that they may say they're American. I don't know how many of them they say they're white. I mean, to me, a real issue is uh, that I somehow have uh, discussions with some of my colleagues about is Somehow there's a there's a theory that everybody's going to become white eventually, and I, I I'd rather say everybody's going to become American eventually, and which means that whether you're white or whether you're not, you still have the same rights, you still have the opportunities, and so forth, and that uh, it, that's not necessarily goal to be white; it's goal to be an American, and and I think that it's still kind of fluid among these different groups as we go older, but it is true some of it, at least people who are third generation now, it means the first generation was a long time ago are less likely to say they're Latino than back then. What's going to happen to today's younger Latinos when they have second and third generations following them, I'm not sure will be the same. Thank you. There's, there's been um, some discussion, and, and I'm trying to put this into a question form because I'm going to be more statements and questions. And so if you're in the discussion, I apologize that I may be, uh, I may be overriding what you're asking. But um, one thing that we've noticed in Texas is um, especially um, since the 1990s, but especially over the past um, 10 or 15 years, there's been a lot of cuts to education and higher education spending. Um, how much do you think this reflects the, the break between the, the generations? You talk about this in your book where um, older voters tend to only support um, Social Security and not support other programs, whereas and, and do, you think, do you think this is going to be worse in states that are more diverse? Yeah, I'm not going to get into a political <laughs> conundrum here because I don't know enough about Texas to be able to say what it is. There is a study by a group called First Focus who, who looks at young people, uh, focuses, I think, on 0 to 9 or 0 to 14 or something like that age group. They did it a few years ago, and they did a survey of states and how much they put funding into uh, youth programs, I think, especially tied to, to education for younger people. And they did find that the states had had the, and they used my measure, my cultural generation gap measure, and the states had had the highest cultural generation gaps with the least funding into the younger, into the younger generation schooling. So at least there's one piece of evidence. I'm not sure how Texas fared in that one, but there's some piece of evidence that there, there is some political backlash, I guess, to some of the changing demography of the younger generations by older people who don't see them as, you know, their children or their grandchildren, maybe don't want to be able to, to part with their hard-earned money for that. But that changes over time, I think, as these older folks 
have young people who marry someone of a different race and background and have grandchildren who are different races. And I think that's what's going to happen over time across large parts of the country. Thank you. Um, there's also a question, uh, another question from um, Erin Nieto Salinas. And um, she, she wants to know about um, the Latino, white, and Asian white marriages you mentioned. Is there data on um, the genders of the couples? Um, they tend to be primarily white me male, Latino female, or something else, et cetera. I'm sure there's a study that has done that, but I'm not, I don't have those facts at my fingertips, I'm afraid. So I, I can't really say that, 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 uh, that I know that to be the case one way or the other, I'm afraid. I'll have to punt on that one. Thank you. Um, so the next question is from um, Guillermo Gonzalez, and he, he wants to know, are new generation Republicans demographically different from their older, um, old, from older, more established Republicans? Well, I mean, I have seen some Pew studies, and Pew does a lot of, the Pew Research Center here in Washington does a lot of studies on attitudes about politics and other issues uh, from a generational standpoint. And I do remember, and you may have to look back and, and, and you could go to it in more detail, that the younger uh, Republicans are somewhat more liberal. They're, they're not as liberal as younger Democrats, but they're somewhat more liberal than, than their older peers on things like politics, like, you know, their potential voting patterns in the next election, like things like immigration reform and, and other issues that the older population is not quite as, as, uh, as liberal on within the Republican Party. But still, compared to the Democratic, uh, their Democratic counterparts are much more conservative. But there is a generational effect. Excellent. The next question is from Francisco Zamora. He wants to know, um, is there going to be another big generation like the millennials and like the baby boomers coming up in the future, or are we just going into a decline on the size of generation? Well, that's a very interesting demographic question because, um, you know, demographers historically have found that there are these kind of humps going along. So the baby boomers, you know, had all these, uh, are, are the, the children of a very small birth cohort, and they had all of these children. And then the children of the baby boomers, uh, then a few years later, even though the genera generation Xers uh, themselves weren't big generations, then the next group who were the children of the baby boomers were a big generation. So from a demographic standpoint, when you have a lot of women in their childbearing ages, by the time they get to their childbearing ages, then they have another bunch of children. But the real question is, to what degree is fertility going to continue to be at the same level going forward? And I think that there is an issue that we don't know a lot about. The United States, even though um, you know our fertility rate is going down from what it was in the past, still has higher fertility than a lot of other countries in the Western world. And uh, fertility is still high, especially among Latino groups, not high as it had been. It's still now, the most recent, uh, the most recent uh, numbers show that Latino fertility is about at replacement level, it used to be higher than replacement level. Replacement level means uh, as women go through their age, uh, uh, through their uh, their reproductive cycle, they generate the same number of people that will replace them as they get older. Uh, and so, uh, you know, fertility is still re reasonably high among Latinos, but I think a lot of the issue is uh, our economic impacts going to make people less uh, likely to have children? Uh, and uh, are there going to just trends that are going to have people to have less likely to have children? We know that among millennials, uh, you know, they put back the age of marriage to what it was beforehand. We've had, we've had an increasing age of marriage for a long time, but I think the impact of the recession in the late night in 2008, uh, as millennials were reaching sort of the middle of their 20s and so forth, made them think that they need to wait a little longer to commit to getting married. And I think this pandemic is going to also have an impact on people delaying getting married. So the question is, you know, what, is there going to be a, a, an uptake in a birth maybe when the economy eventually gets better? I think that's a real important question. So I don't know if we're going to have this kind of general up and down fertility pattern quite as uh, strictly as we've had in the past, both because of the nature of, um, you know, both men and women wanting to spend more time uh, with their careers before they decide to have children and these big shocks to our economy. So an another question that just came up is um, the differences between Asian and Latino millennials. And in particular, there's a huge gap in higher educational payments in the groups. And what impact do you see this will have? Because you've written in your, in your book and in your talk as kind of the new minorities. What impact do you think this will have on economy and politics in the future? And how do you think this gap can be closed? 
You know, that's very important. And as I tried to say in this talk, uh, it's important not for the people in these groups, but it's important for the nation as a whole to have these younger generations uh, be as well educated as they want to be and uh, so that they're able to be productive and productive for themselves and for productive for the economy. I, I'm often concerned uh, when I listen to a lot of these presidential debates and, you know, political discussions and so forth. That's not a topic that comes up very often. To me, it should be one of the top topics that people should be talking about in terms of what our country is going to be like in the future because, you know, the difference uh, has a lot to do with the communities and the resources available to the communities that these different people live in, different groups live in. So uh, if you're living in a community that's kind of under-resourced and has, you know, segregated schools and, uh, you know, there's just not a lot of state or uh, local money going into those school districts, uh, you know, it's a self-perpetuating cycle. And you know, to me, this is a state problem and a federal problem that needs to be addressed given, you know, just looking at this demography. So uh, I, the answer is more resources, how those resources get put so that teachers, uh, good people and good talented people want to be teachers in those classrooms and that, you know, the right kind of other resources are available. I think it's an important challenge for this country because we do have the, the person power here. A lot of European countries have very small younger generations. Uh, you know, they have almost declines in their labor force populations going ahead. But we don't because of the immigration that we have here and uh, uh, because of uh, the people that are living in, in these communities. We have the opportunity to make sure that they are educated and given the opportunities that they, they, they deserve and it will it will benefit this country in great ways and and i'm very you know i'm not into the education policy world i have a lot of colleagues who are but i am saddened when i listen to a lot of these political discussions that this is not a more important topic for discussion there was an informational question here um and it's related to how people are classified so for example if a person um has, has a white mother or father and an african-american um to a white parent and an African American parent, how does the federal government um, rate, uh, put them into categories? You talked about the categories earlier. It's very complicated, I have to say, because the, the federal, for that particular case, it's somewhat simpler. Uh, first of all, the federal government asks you to def define who you are. And if you think you're multiracial, then you say you're multiracial. So, in fact, you can actually say in the census form you have a white mother and a black father, whatever it is, and you can say you're, you're a person of two or more races and they will accept your word for it and they will use it. The complicated part is that the, the, the Census Bureau and the Office of Management Budget does not strictly consider Hispanic status a race. They consider it a hip, ethnicity. Now, in my book, I treat Hispanic status the same way I do whites or blacks or Asians and so forth as a separate racial group. And as a result, I come up with a higher rate of interracial marriages than you would if you just looked at intermarriages between whites and blacks and whites and Asians, but not whites and Hispanics. So it's a complicated way of saying um, it's better to do that. And, and uh, uh, But if you use the strict government standards, uh, you identify yourself as multiracial if you're only one of, of the uh, a product of the two racial group uh, of the several racial groups that the Census Bureau cause, uh, uses as race, which is white, uh, black, or African-American. Asian American, uh, Amer American Indian or Alaska Native, uh, and uh, I think there's another one, and then some other race. But the Hispanic is kind of a separate thing, so it makes it a little bit complicated thing for statistics. But I, I forget about that, and I count Hispanic and white parents having multiracial children. Thank you. And, and another question that came up was, what role does immigration play in your, um, in your protections? Um, and would, would that affect your conclusions at all? Yes, uh, immigration does have an impact. Uh, the, the Census Bureau, I use the Census Bureau's immigration projections, and they uh, uh, just this last year came out with alternative sets of projections, each assuming a different level of immigration. Uh, so instead of using the kind of immigration that they have in their main projection, which is about a million immigrants a year, more or less going into the future, and broken down largely the way they have in most recent years in terms of country and origin being Latin America or Asia and Africa and so forth. Uh, and that's that's basically the basis of, of the projections I use here from the Census Bureau. But
But the, the recent, several months ago, they came out with what happens if you only cut immigration in half. Uh, and you cut immigration in half, what you do is uh, you get to a situation where the younger population in the labor force starts declining, which is not a very good thing. What doesn't happen when you cut immigration in half is you don't make the country whiter. It still becomes more racially diverse because this older white population continues to die off and uh, the younger population is mostly racial and ethnic minorities, as I said, largely because most of Latino growth in the U.S. is from fertility, not from immigration. So uh, it has an impact, immigration, on population growth and especially making the country more aged. We don't have immigration, we become a lot more older. But in terms of racial and ethnic diversity, we come, become a little less diverse, but we don't become whiter if we stop immigration. I'm going to try to merge a few questions, too. I apologize to everyone who's answering interesting questions, but uh, we do have a lot of questions, and I want to get to as many as possible, so I'm kind of going to kind of merge some questions together. So I apologize to you in advance for not asking your exact question. But there, there have been several questions related to, um, do you believe that the, um, the, the changing demographics, the influx of minority and young minority voters, would be able to swing the election, this election, um, this year? It's possible, and uh, that's why I highlighted some of those states in that uh, in that uh, you know slide that I gave you, especially Arizona, and uh, Georgia, and Florida, and maybe Texas. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think the key thing is turnout. Typically, the younger population turns out at a much lower rate than the older population. I think it's about, if I have this right, 50% for people under age 40 and 70% for people over age 55. So, you know, those over age 55 people turn out to vote at a lot bigger. But it could be in particular elections, in particular states, uh, that there's enough enthusiasm and energy among these younger folks to then to make a bigger difference. And of course, if the election is close, every vote counts. So if you have a strong voting preference, even among people who don't turn out that much, but they, they vote much more strongly in one direction than they would have in the past, that could make a difference as well. And I think Arizona is a place where that can make a difference. Arizona is a place where I, I, I calculated cultural generation gaps for different states. And Arizona comes out number one on terms of how white is the older population and how diverse is the younger population. Because Arizona attracts a lot of old white seniors from all over the country, but also gets a lot of people of color, uh, but not only immigrants, but from California and other places like that. Uh, so I think this will be an interesting election where, where in Arizona they could, those young folks could really very well make a difference in, in turning that democratic. There have been a couple of comments from people about, um, about the importance of whites in the Republican Party. Um, but this obviously isn't completely true. There are obviously some minorities in the, the, the Republicans too. How important is that share for the Republicans? In, um, and and do you think that, um, and how do you think this will change over time? Yeah, I think that's an interesting issue. Uh, and, you know, here it comes into, at least for the current election and the 2016 election, uh, the Electoral College, because we have some states that are a lot whiter than other states, and some of those are swing states. So in the many simulations that I did with my colleagues uh, in the future, I only showed one of them here, there are quite a few that the Republicans win in the Electoral College, but they don't win in the popular vote, as with the case in 2016, where Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but Donald Trump won the Electoral College because he was able to pick off some pretty white states uh, where the whites in those states voted very strongly for him. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't know that uh, a party can rely on that happening indefinitely in the future. They rely on just a few white states <laughs> to come and uh, win the election in the Electoral College, even though they may be losing the popular vote and losing a lot of other states, especially as states in the South and the more racially diverse states in the South and the West become more racially diverse than they are now and vote more Democratic than they do now. So uh, I think it's important for the Republican Party. They may eke out another couple of wins, we'll know, this, this year uh, on that Electoral College front. But it's not a very good long-term strategy, uh, at least nationally, as a party. We have a question here about um, how people vote. Is there evidence to suggest that um, that older people vote more based upon candidates rather than parties, or vice versa? Is it um, 
is it uh, is it not much evidence on that? You know, I'm not. Sh Someone else probably knows that answer better than I do. But uh, my guess is, given the quite strong vote of the older population, especially the older white vote for Republicans over the years, uh, no matter who the candidate was, uh, with some exceptions, uh, when there was a Southern white vote, or when there's a Southern Democrat voting, and in, in which case, uh, that like Jimmy Carter or Bill Clinton, uh, then then you know a lot of the whites in the South didn't vote quite as strongly for Republicans as they as they do. Uh, that uh, I would say the party is pretty good indicator, but obviously the, the, the enthusiasm for the candidate is going to depend on that individual and, and maybe whatever the issue might be. If there's a very strong issue that's, that sort of ameliorates, uh, you know, that, that cuts across Democratic and Republican lines. But it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty solid nationally and in a lot of states that, uh, that older, especially white population has been voting Republican. Thank you. For, for the listeners, I want to thank once again for all these great questions, and I apologize if I'm not going to do And I also apologize in advance. I'm kind of paraphrasing people and combining questions. If I if I butcher your question to the point where you're not sure I was asking your question, I, I am doing my best about doing this. I also want to say there's been a lot of comments thanking you for your presentation, Dr. Guy. Everyone, many people have said what a wonderful presentation it is. So, so thank no, you I appreciate very that. much thank for that. Um, a question from Nilda Garcia. Do you think it's possible for our system to transform and depart from the two-party system? Whoa. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I, you know, I just do my demographics. I, <laughs> that's kind of a bigger question. I, it, you know, we did see in 2016 there was a lot of third-party voting. And, uh, you know, I think the political scientists who looked at it said that third-party voting, if those people would have voted strongly in, in the Democratic column, then we would have a different president than we had. Uh, so it meant that there were a number of people who were dissatisfied with both candidates enough to be able to vote for a third party, but it still has been pretty, pretty small. It's true that a lot of, uh, especially younger people, register as independents rather than Democrats or Republicans, but they do tend to lean toward one party to another. And again, in these two research surveys, surveys show that uh, uh, a, stance, a substantial amount of these independent younger people lean Democratic whereas a substantial part of the older people who are independent lean Republican. But uh, I would say on that basis, we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, if, if the parties do a pretty bad job of elect, selecting candidates maybe in the future, then maybe that would, maybe a third party would emerge. Thank you. Um, a question from Anthony Montes Chilo. Um, um, you want to know about Middle Eastern mi mi minorities. Do you think they'll become more important? To, will they have an effect on the changing political sphere within the next 10 years or so? Well, I think they can. They might, especially in states where they have a significant population. I'm thinking offhand now, California or Michigan. There's probably several others. Uh, I don't know the Texas numbers. Uh, and, and I think that's important. Interestingly enough, uh, the Census Bureau and uh, the government, the Office of Management and Budget, considered having a special racial category called Middle East and North African with very strong uh, uh, sort of pressure by groups who wanted to have that happen. And it almost did happen. At the very last minute, the Office of Management and Budget decided that they didn't want to do it. Uh, so uh, there's enough of an interest among identifying that group. Of, and now, in fact, in census statistics, it's hard to find the Middle East North African because they either identify as white or some other race uh, rather than having their own kind of category. So we, we would have a better sense of that group. But I think it's it, in, in certain areas, certain in certain states, and certainly in certain local elections, they can have an important impact uh, in, in what's going, going on. And um, Cesar Cruz wants to ask about, he, he said you mentioned all the non-college whites versus college whites. Mm -hmm. and, their, and differences in voting patterns. Is, is, do, you, do you see the same differences in things like the Hispanic population? Not as much. I mean, it, it's usually the case that, uh, uh, you know, I think the bigger difference in the Hispanic population is within different Hispanic groups, Cubans, Puerto Ricans, uh, Mexicans, other Central Americans and South Americans have different levels of support. Uh, and I think that's probably a bigger distinction uh, than the education and the education uh, breakdown. Based upon your projection, this is a question from Leonard Gonzalez. Based upon your projections about um, the population um, becoming increasingly di di diverse across states, you think um, 
Is it still going to is it is it still going to remain does it still remain concentrated in, in metropolitan areas of diverse population? Or or is it um, spreading across the entire state or just different states? You know, it's it's spreading. I mean, I don't think the spread is going to be immediate and quick, but I mean, as I showed with those suburbanization statistics, we now have more Latinos in the suburbs than in cities now for two censuses in a row. And if you look at even further sort of inner suburbs versus outer suburbs and even rural areas, there are certainly large parts of the country where there are a lot of Latinos in rural areas, uh, and uh, uh, similarly for other, other groups. So I, I think that, um, you know, the white population is declining in about two-thirds of the 3,000 counties in the United States. So any county that wants to increase its population and wants to come up with policies to increase its population or to attract businesses to increase the kind of workers that come there are by definition are going to attract people of color uh, because the white population is declining. So I think by that basis, we're gonna see many more people sort of spreading out to these other places. A question from Nicholas Hudson. Um, what role do you think internal migration patterns are going to, what role do they affect those political projections you have for the electoral or college that you were, that you were discussing? Oh, that's a very good demographic question. Um, and we did a very sophisticated uh, treatment of those internal migration patterns. We took the Census Bureau's data from the American Community Survey, which shows migration flows into and out of each state to other regions of the country, broken down by race and uh, gender and age. And that was part of our project. Now, the problem with that is we don't know what those internal migration patterns are going to be for the future. You know, right now, Texas gets a lot of internal migrants. So when we project Texas's population ahead, uh, by those different groups, you know, it gets bigger and it gets bigger, more whites, more blacks, more Hispanic, you know, and other states, uh, maybe, you know, Kansas or South Dakota or Wyoming or someplace like that or West Virginia are losing uh, those populations in every round of the projection. So uh, we didn't have the crystal ball to say that, but I think we did a better job of our, by at least doing that than uh, assuming nothing or that it was going to stay the status quo. Uh, but uh, that that is going to be an important idea. and. You know, there's some political scientists that have the idea that people move to different states because of the politics in those states. In other words, if you're living in a red state, you want to only move, and you're a person who votes Democrat, you want to move to a blue state. I don't actually agree with that. I think people move uh, for other reasons. They, they move largely to get jobs or to go to college, or if they're retiring, they go to some place where they want to retire. Uh, that, you know, the political party is not something that's a big deal for them. Uh, but it does show that uh, even at that, if you have a, a place like Texas, which has lots of jobs and are, are attracting people from all around the country, some of those people are from California, a very blue state. Some of those people are from New York, a very blue state. So the political orientation of people moving to a state uh, may, cha may change the state uh, after a while. And uh, even if they're not moving only for the politics, but they're moving for other reasons. We have another another interesting question, um, and uh, I, I will editorialize a little bit on it before I I'll give you the question. Then I editorialize. But do you think the pandemic will make a difference on the in the long run on demographics? I want to stress now that our next speaker in this series is going to talk about this topic. So, um, um, so but I'll turn to Dr. Fry now. Um, so come to our next talk as well because that will be that will be dealing with that issue. Um, but Dr. Fry. Sure. I mean, I can't talk about the, the health impact on, on the pandemic on, you know, mortality rates or anything like that. You need someone who knows that issue well. I do get a lot of questions, though, if, the, if that current migration patterns out of cities because of the high rates of COVID in those cities will, you know, permanently change the population in those cities. And to that, I don't think my answer is, I don't think that's going to be the case. I think that that's more of a temporary move, that, that people move all the time. Every year, there's a group of young people who get out of their parents' homes or leave college and decide where they're going to move. And that's going to be the case year after year as we move ahead into the future. So a couple of years from now, when we don't have a pandemic uh, and the vaccine has been in, in, invented, then big cities that maybe now be losing people to the suburbs or rural areas they're going to be attractive again to those people. So I, I think it's too soon to say today's temporary migration is going to be the way things are going to be in the future. 
as the population changes and these demographic forces come into play, um, what do you think the Republican Party will do, um, given that it's so reliant on the power of white voters? You know, I always say that politicians are the best demographers. They know exactly how to count the people. They know exactly how to count the votes. And sooner or later, they're going to figure out that the votes are going to be with these young generations of Latinos, of Asians, of African Americans, and uh, they're going to figure out how to be able to get their votes. And if they can't do it, then they're not going to be successful. Sorry for the moment. I was, I was just scrolling through questions. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, another question from um, Rob Thomas is, is Europe experiencing the same demographic shift as the United States? Well, I can say that uh, there are a lot of European countries that have much higher uh, elderly dependency rates, that is the percentage of old people compared to the people in their working ages, simply because they've had lower fertility and lower immigration. I'm talking about a lot of Eastern European countries, Italy, even Germany are in that kind of situation. And in those countries, uh, interestingly enough, uh, some of them anyway, there's been a big push against immigration, which is demographically nonsensical <laughs> because if you're in a country that is aging rapidly and needs, you know, to boost up your labor force, you should figure out the best way to, to be able to draw people into your borders and to, you know, educate them and make them part of your labor force. I think probably the extreme case of that is Japan. Uh, you know, where, you know, very soon there's a 40% of the population will be over age 65. That's not a good situation to be in. So uh, I think, uh, you know, there are European countries in that situation, uh, and they don't have a history of immigration that we do. And uh, as a result, it's more difficult for them, I think, to, to deal with it. Another question that came up is, um, do you think there's a single, how much do you think this is driven by single issue voting, this, this demographic breaks in voting? Um, or how much does it do to just other things? It's hard to say. I mean, it depends on the state and the community and, uh, and the candidates. Uh, you know, I think in, in general, the, the older population, as we talked about earlier, maybe becomes more conservative over time, worried about having higher taxes and worrying about too much government regulation. That's kind of a Republican message. And uh, they tend to abide by that message. Now, more recently, I think it's fair to say that uh, the issue of immigration is something that's brought up uh, and able to curry the favor of some of those older, older, whiter populations who didn't grow up in an era where there was a lot of immigration and maybe scared that uh, it's changing the way the country in a way they don't like it. So that's another issue that's been brought up recently. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's, there's a band of things, I think, that, that makes them somewhat different than, uh, than the issues that younger people are, are interested in. As I say, the, the younger population especially is probably energized by what's going on since this pandemic, how they see their futures may have been affected by the way the government has treated them during this pandemic, and also by uh, these kind of uh, you know, racial, uh, racial equity types of issues that have been coming along. So I see them, uh, a whole set of issues that can energize them. Thank you very much. I think we're about reaching the end of our time now. So I want to thank Dr. Fry for this excellent presentation. I, there were so many comments um, thanking him um, during the, during the, as I was scrolling through the screens. And I know you couldn't see them because you were thinking about answering the question. So thank you for coming. We, 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 greatly, in, we greatly enjoyed your talk and we, we hope that we'll get to, you'll get to uh, visit us again at some point to talk about other work we're doing. Um, thank you for everyone who came. We had over 300 people here listening, to, listening. so thank you for everyone coming. And I'm sorry, I apologize again if I didn't get to your question or if I over-paraphrased your, 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 your question. Um, this is our first talk of the, of the year. Our, our next talk is in November, and it's going to be on how COVID is going to affect um, the economy and um, demographic change in, in particular. Um, Professor from um, University of Maryland and from the Brookings Institute, Melissa Kinney, is going to be giving, giving the call. So thank you, Dr. Fry. We've, I've, this has been a great thing. And, and I would encourage everyone to go out and get the book. It's, uh, the, 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 the book will answer all your questions in much more depth than you could cover in a one and a half hour presentation. Thank you.